thank you for coming. Thank you for spending your time with us, uh, prioritizing part of your day. Um, and, and really, I've been learning from our folks, uh, friends at Natural Curiosity, to really unlearn hurrying, taking time to enjoy the relationships we have. And, and so this is a great time for us to celebrate the relationships. Our relationships today are with uh, two amazing people, Sylvia Denton Carroll and Jan O'Reilly, who've been doing some great work with some other amazing educators, both in the schools and outdoor educators. And so that's what we're going to learn about today. Just to give you an overview of what today looks like, I want to, again, always honour the land that we're on. So we'll do that after our introduction uh, are our speakers, Sylvia and Jan. Um, actually, I might just do the land acknowledgement and then come back to um, the introduction. That way I can do that properly. So I don't know if you know this, but thumbs up if you do, but there is a project called Ojima Mekane, or Mekane, I'm not sure, Mekana, perhaps, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly, um, which is the Anishinaabek way of renaming the place names. And if you go to their website, you can see works in uh, all across Ontario where where things are being torn down and indigenous people are being erased and this is a, and their histories and their cultures are being erased and this is one way that they are reclaiming this space i'm just going to read a little bit from their website it says for the past 3 to 4 years the uh, Ojima Makana project has been replacing official street lines street signs and historical plaques in the city of Toronto with Anishinaabe versions. And they're slowly reclaiming their territories from what they call an alien landscape that is committed to erasing us while contributing to the growing indigenous cultural, political and linguistic revitalization efforts across Turtle Island. In the space between raising up our nations and languages and reminding non-Indigenous people that they are on Indigenous land, we hope to create dialogue. And that's what it's all about. It's all about relationships, building relationships to the land, building relationships to our place, building relationships with each other as we reconcile um, our, our really pa uh, horrible past of colonizing and erasing Indigenous peoples. So in light of that, uh, we acknowledge that we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. All right, so welcome. Uh, and then, uh, again, bonjour. It's great to have everybody here. Let me just tell you a little bit about our speakers. Um, I had, uh, I think, Sylvia, we've met, it's only, it's really been five years or so. Um, oh, my <laughs> yeah, where uh, she came into the outdoor ed uh, department. And so we had the pleasure of working together. Um, but you were at actually one of my favorite schools up in uh, the Northwest with Carolyn Atwell and some of the friends up there. Yes. Um, but Sylvia Denton Carroll, uh, is an outdoor learning coordinator for the TDSB, and she's well positioned to be a, such an expert. In this new initiative, Sylvia provides leadership and support to a team of outdoor education teachers as they work to engage school communities in outdoor learning within their local green space. And prior to this new role, so it's really only two years old uh, yes. role, you've worked as an outdoor education teacher, and as a site supervisor, and probably done both at the same time backwards, um, <laughs> you're passionate about using the outdoors as a third teacher and firmly believes that students from diverse backgrounds should see themselves reflected and experience the outdoors as welcoming spaces. So welcome to you, Sylvia. Thank you. Your partner in crime, uh, mm -hmm. not you've committed any crimes at all, but um, your partner in this work is Jan O'Reilly. And Jan, you manage system-wide data collection processes and the dissemination of results to support school and board improvement planning. You undertake evaluation to improve policies, programs, and practices, and partners with educators to build our capacity and to use this research to improve our practices. You're passionate about working in collaboration with practitioners to bridge the gap between knowledge and practice and engaging in research that is really driven by the people in the board as well as our communities um, 
and the needs that we have to serve, uh, really to serve TDSB by improving our policies, programs, and practices. And Jan, we've just met recently and already, again, just your work is so highly regarded, not only in the report that I read, uh, but we want to work with you too because of, of the great work you've done. <laughs> Thanks. You know, thanks, Pam. Doing this. <laughs> all right. So, um, again, so welcome to all of you here and to our guest speakers. Let me just um, pull my screen up. Yes. So, welcome again, everyone. So wonderful to see so many faces, and I'm happy that you're here. So, today we're going to um, talk a little bit about the background, so how this initiative got started. Um, why it began, uh, the goals of the initiative, outdoor learning support to schools. Um, so what were some, some goals that, that were that were intended for the initiative and what were some of the key findings? Um, we're gonna talk about the research collaboration and you already um, heard Jan and uh, her introduction. So we're gonna talk about that and how that collaboration started. Um, we're gonna highlight the findings from our research finding, highlight the findings. And, um, and have moments for you to also share and, and think about the benefits and what you've noticed as it relates to outdoor learning. And then sharing of um, knowledge and um, how we've been mobilizing the research finding and what we've discovered over the last two years. So to get started, we wanted to start with a poll and the question, as you see on the slide there is, how would you describe your comfort level with taking learning outdoors? So if you could just take a moment to respond to the poll question um, in the chat as it pops up on the screen, and we'll talk about that for a little bit. So do you think it's a walk in the park? It's, it's easy, it comes naturally to you. Um, it's, it's, it's something you enjoy doing, you, it it's comes with ease. It's okay, like you have your moments where it's okay, um, or is it something that causes you to be nervous, you're not sure? Um, uh, so how do you feel and what's your comfort level? Well, Sylvia, it looks like lots of people have a, um, a combination between okay and walk in a park. And that's yeah. actually great. We haven't yes. seen that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So wonderful to hear that combination. And um, it's interesting because a lot of the, the teachers that we're working with, this is their range of feelings of how they how what they're thinking about the outdoors. And um, yeah, for some of them, they when they agreed volunteer to be a part of this initiative, some of them were nervous, many of them were nervous, and they kind of just want to know more about it. And they want to take their students outside, but not sure how. And um, through this partnership, they were able to find more ways to do that. Um, and then there were some teachers who uh, they were really comfortable and just really wanted to think partner um, in this journey of taking students outside more. So we'll talk about the range of that and also the, the feedback that we got from both educators and uh, students. So this outdoor learning support to schools, it came out of a board motion that actually first started, um, the, the talking of it started in uh, December, 2020. Um, that, when, that was when the first discussions uh, about it came about. And we all remember that during those times we were um, really deep in COVID. Um, but then that those conversations around um, supporting schools uh, in their local green space and in their schoolyards, that continued to be the discussion. And, that, and in spring, 2021, there's a board motion and the board motion was to really think about a long-term plan to support uh, schools with outdoor learning. So outside of the recess and the lunch times, what could it look like if we are taking students outside um, with intention and with um, in curriculum connected ways uh, during the school day. So what that could look like. And so that's that was the beginning of that specific board motion. And from there, 24 schools were chosen. Um, and so the 24 schools are, there's six schools in each of the LCs. So from LC1 to LC4. And our outdoor teachers, um, they are also part of this initiative. So our outdoor ed teachers um, work to support schools in this in this partnership, as well as um, support uh, their centers um, with programming at the centers. So we've had different iterations of this, as you've heard, we're in our second year. In our first year, we had uh, four outdoor ed teachers that were solely um, connected to the schools, the 24 schools that are in the outdoor learning support to schools. Um, but as different decisions had to be made due to cuts and all kinds of things that many departments are experiencing and restructuring, then uh, we shifted the model so that um, 
we are now supporting, we added one more school, but also this year we have nine teachers, but they are they are working with their centers and working with a support to school. So they essentially have a hybrid, um, a hybrid role. And so supporting uh this year it's 25 schools across, as I said, all LCs, working with host teachers who volunteered. And um, they're really working, as I said before, to support learning through the outdoors and reimagining what that could look like um, as it connects to the curriculum. And a lot of times I get the question about how were these schools picked? How were the 24 schools last year? And then uh, this year we added a Kepamacha way, one during spirit, so 25 this year, how were they picked? So they were picked um, from by the superintendent. And so the, the things that they looked at for school selection was, um, it was based on LOI. It was uh, based on diverse and racialized student population, um, access, access to outdoor spaces um, or perceived barriers and, and access to outdoor spaces. And uh, so those were some of the things that were looked at um, uh, in terms of school selection. And, um, and then based on that, then teachers volunteered once they heard about what the initiative would entail. So Pam said a little bit about this, but I thought it might just be helpful because I wasn't sure who the audience was just to talk a little bit about the role of the research department in the TDSB. And so a big piece of that, we kind of focus in two main areas. One is around data analytics, where we support board and school improvement planning processes through the use of data. Um, and a lot of that is data that comes from our student information system, but also from large scale system surveys that we do like our student census and school climate surveys. So that's sort of one big piece. And then another big piece is kind of like the work we're doing with the outdoor ed department. We do a lot of evaluate, evaluative work um, with either programs, initiatives, departments, um, looking at supporting the effective delivery of, of these programs and initiatives through ongoing evaluation processes um, and approaches. And the way that we work is really, we're applied researchers. So we have to be very immersed in the work. We have to actually really understand the work. We're not content experts. So we really need to work very closely with practitioners in the field so that we actually understand what the initiatives are trying to achieve, uh, what inputs and resources are being put into them, how they'd like to use the evaluation findings. And so we work in a very um, participatory and collaborative way um, in those evaluations. And we work all across the system. We work on the program side, the academic side with the departments like the outdoor ed team. And we also work on the operational side as well. And sometimes that work is guided by people reaching out to us as was the case with the outdoor ed department, um, which is great. And so they wanted to use evaluation um, findings. They requested our support to help them in a couple of ways. And I think really it was focused on one, how do we use these findings to improve this initiative and continue to improve what we're doing? How can we further enhance the department as a whole and the supports that they're able to provide to the system? And then once we have this information, how can we actually use it to promote and grow outdoor learning across the TDSB? John, and it was so important, like when this initiative started, um, one of the things that I really, that I'm glad that the research team uh, joined on, on this journey was because it was so brand new. And we know that it takes a lot some, in some spaces for outdoor learning to work in a way that's successful. And I wanted to really have research to have an eye and a lens to see um, to capture what it is that it takes for, for this to happen in a successful way. Um, and what does collaborative learning look like in those spaces, um, in those varied spaces. So, so thankful that, um, that John has been a part of this journey from the, from the beginning. Um, Cause uh, through this process, yes, we want to capture, but it also helped us to be more reflective about what was happening and about our work with teachers and our work with schools and aspects of sustainability and um, capturing feedback and help us to really think through what we were doing in a more meaningful way. Um, and some of the, the things that we, we um, wanted to really look at was um, our goals. And so our goals at the beginning of this initiative was really quite simple. And it was really about getting educators getting students outside. Um, as I said, we started in, in the midst of COVID, but even beyond COVID, thinking about how we can get schools to use their local green space more, um, to use their neighboring parks more, their schoolyards, and so really provide um, increased outdoor learning opportunities. And the key thing is to do it um, outside of recess and lunchtime. So what would that look like? Um, what would that those kind of learning opportunities look like? And then for, um, we also wanted to build capacity. And so, um, 
so many times um, when we met with different educators, they would say things like, well, I'm not sure if I know enough to take the learning outside or, you know, I don't know the name of that tree or that plant or that bird. And, and, you know, some of the things we would always say is that that's okay. Like you start with what you know, and we, and you build from that, um, from that point. And so a part of one of our goals was to build capacity and for educators to feel more confident about, you know, taking the learning outside and, and what are those small steps to, to, to be engaged in learning more um, each day and what that could look like. And then also to build confidence. And so being more familiar with outdoors, with the outdoors, just getting outside more, getting into routine. It could have been simple things like a community walk or tree observations or observing different things that are happening in your schoolyard, but building that confidence to assemble in your kids and going through the door. And you know, that might sound like something that's so simple, but for some educators, like that was that was a big deal to be able to, to do that and build that into your routine um, of something that happens uh, fairly consistently. And so the, you know, different educators start at different in different places. Um, and, and it was different, definitely cyclical. And um, and for some people, it was, you know, for the for those educators who were already came in with a, a skill set and a knowledge about the outdoors, it was to continue to build that capacity and having someone to think and reflect and reflect with. Um, for some of um, educators, it was to build their confidence and saying, yes, I can do this. Um, and I could do this with, with a with a class of 30. Um, and for some of that building that confidence, it was like looking at the challenges and the barriers. We know that there are some. And so as they build confidence and build their um, their capacity, then for some of them, you know, those pieces are what help them to become more confident with taking a large group outside. Um, and what that meant, whether or not, you know, let's say it was primary, and you need support, what does that look like? How do you navigate that? Or how do you navigate different exceptionalities um, outdoors and, and, and in different spaces? So it looks different in different spaces. And so definitely this was sort of like, these were our goals that kind of worked um, together and simultaneously sometimes at the same time. And, and I'm just gonna interrupt as I look at the list of people that are in the room, Sylvia, there are some amazing um, educators that are very confident at doing this. And, mm -hmm. um, and yet um, I think about, you know, maybe reflecting to the first time that we, we did this, um, <laughs> you can imagine where your study was, but I think you've already given us a nugget that reflecting, because even though we may become um, really good at our job, the students in front of us keep changing. And if mm -hmm. we don't keep reflecting and make sure that our, that we're meeting their needs, we stay stuck in practices that may not be serving the people in front of us. Absolutely. Yeah. And so are the outdoor ed co-teacher, um, you know, these were generally, this was generally what their roles were um, as it, as they work through the partnership. And it was to come alongside teachers, um, we call them the host teachers, and to help to facilitate um, the learning with with the host teacher to share resources, great resources or webinars connected to outdoor learning. Um, to even go through maybe different lessons and do that together with a host teacher. I'm um, really centering student voice. That was a huge part of everything that we did. Listen intently um, to students and what they were saying about the outdoor experience, about what they want to learn. Listen to the inqu inquiries that were bubbling up when we're in outdoor spaces and really being um, mindful of, of all of those observations that helped to drive what outdoor learning looked like um, as the OECTs, outdoor ed co-teachers, as they visited those spaces on a regular basis. Um, and they worked for the co-teachers to, to co-plan. They co-planned lessons that um, sometimes were taught without them. Um, sometimes those lessons were taught with the, with the outdoor ed co-teacher um, and really thinking about how to embed any aspects of the curriculum um, into outdoor learning. And for some host teachers, that was new because um, sometimes the easy fit is science, science in the outdoors. Um, but then how do we branch that into other subject areas? So that was some new learning for some of the outdoor, uh, the, sorry, for some of the host teachers and for the outdoor co-teachers to work with the host teachers on. And then really facilitating conversations around students' lived experiences. You heard in the beginning that I mentioned that many of our students, um, the schools were selected because of diverse uh, population, LOI. So really centering what their lived experiences are, what their interactions and relationships are with their neighborhood and honoring that. So whether it was going on a community walk and centering places that they visit um, 
and really speak into what it is that they do in their neighborhood. Sometimes it was visiting a local park that they maybe didn't go with their, their families often and why and, and talking about that. And so really centering the students' lived experiences and what they brought uh, to the outdoors and using that as a, as a branching off point. And so sort of the logistical pieces of what this looked like in school. So as I mentioned earlier, it was, it's six LCs per school with the addition of one this year, um, Macho Way Wandering Spirit. And um, they're in schools two days a week. Um, and as I, we know that like last year was the first year and that iteration was a bit different than what happened this year, but this year in schools two days a week and their rotation started in October and they're continuing their rotations even till now. They are approaching their last rotation. They have a total of six. And so they are approaching their last rotation which will happen towards the end of middle to end of May. And um, they are with one to two teachers. In fact, in this, this year, everyone is with two teachers and with the exception of a couple of them are with three teachers. And these are teachers who have volunteered. Um, what that volunteering process looked like was a bit different for different schools, but, but our push was first for teachers to be, uh, to volunteer of their own free will. Um, and so um, there was variations of, of that uh, volunteerism. Um, and because we really wanted teachers to have buy-in um, and to be in, um, excited about outdoor learning and to for that to already be something that they wanted to do and um and then in the conjunction with that there was bribery <laughs> what, did, what was that bribery <laughs> Yes, I've had a few interesting uh, conversations with principals about, about the word volunteers, and um, there was many interpretations of that, of that word. <laughs> And the part of it also was um, the host teachers know and understand that they were going to be a part of the research department, uh, sorry, the research that was happening, and but that this wasn't going to be an add-on. This is already things that they would have already been documenting and doing in their regular practice, just that there's somebody coming alongside them to help to capture some of that. So, you know, maybe, you know, sometimes when you're working with students, you meant to take that picture. Well, the, o the OECT would actually take the picture and have that recorded and, and document some of those pieces. And then have times for you to reflect on that on that learning and what you notice when students were engaged in that particular experience um, and and reflect on that and then use that to guide the next steps. Yeah, so Sylvia talked a little bit about this already. So it wasn't expected that in this collaborative evaluation approach, it wasn't expected that the classroom teachers would be gathering any data um, beyond what they would normally collect as part of everyday um, pedagogical teaching and assessment. Um, but the outdoor education co-teachers in their role um, as part of this initiative were co-researchers in a sense, because what we asked them to do, as Sylvia was alluding to, was sort of like support that documentation, but then in the end also curate it for us so that we could have a look at like, what are your best examples of engagement that happened or, um, you know, where you saw students and, and really big impacts on well-being. Um, and so that really helped Sylvia and I, and, and they shared it with each other, but then they also shared it with us. And that really helped to kind of support and inform the evaluation. And then other pieces of data were sort of more led by the research staff, um, but, but, in, but still in collaboration with the outdoor ed co-teachers. So for example, um, we administered surveys to the teachers. So we had a planning survey and a check-in survey, but those tools were developed um, in collaboration, like co-constructed with the outdoor education teachers. And also um, decisions about when to administer them were also informed by input and feedback from the um, outdoor ed teachers because you know, different schools might've been in different places. And so it didn't make sense to administer the survey that week or whatnot. So there was a lot of flexibility there. Um, and we also had, um, a set of open-ended questions that were posed to students. And again, we co-constructed these together. Um, and this was like to collect in students' initial responses to outdoor learning. And it was collected in a variety of ways, <clears throat> um, depending on students' needs, the local context, as well as the individual documentation practices and preference of the teachers themselves. So it could have been a nature journal, questions posed in the nature journal, or questions posed to students where they then verbally recorded a response or audio recorded something. So in the end, we had a very, very rich, um, and, and this year as well, continue to have a very, very rich um, source of data and information about this initiative that we can continue, and the department can continue to draw on. So we're gonna share some of that with you, um, I think in our next slide, but are we going to have the 
the um, participants break out and talk about something first, Sylvia? Yeah, just before we go to the break room, I just wanted to um, share something that I shared often with Jan and with the team is that just like how the host teacher and the, and the elder co-teacher's relationship was a collaboration and it was co-planning and then co-teaching and then reflecting and then making changes and then deciding on next steps and it was constantly moving that, in that cycle. It's the same way that the elder co-teacher, the team, worked with the, re with the research uh, team. And so it was beautiful that both... Um, things were mirroring each other, our work with the host teacher and then our work with research. And we were constantly co-constructing what uh, that research could look could look like and different areas that we wanted to focus on and then reevaluated that and co-constructed. And so it really, the two the two systems it, it mirrored each other. And, you know, the beginning it was, it was messy because it's just like, what do you mean? We're not gonna just have the results like that and, you know, and that process, but it was really co-constructed together. And then in the end, um, we were able to see how the final pieces kind of all came together. Yeah, I sort of feel like I became, well, I think I feel like a part of the department. Yes. I have a part-time job in the outdoor ed department now. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll so we're gonna have a, mo a moment for breakout rooms and um in those breakout rooms you'll have about maybe five six minutes uh and to just talk about what have you noticed to be the benefits for students and for yourself as educators um as it relates to outdoor learning so what are the benefits of outdoor learning for yourself and for your students what are some things that you've noticed to be true Sylvia did you want to say anything about the the conversations yeah. we just had or yeah I maybe a couple of hands could just share like some things that um that people shared about the benefits uh, for students and for educators i know in the group that i was in um there's conversations about tapping trees um and trees in the neighborhood and asking neighbors uh for permission to tap their trees and using uh turn that to graphs and using that for math and literacy and different ideas around art and leaves and researching when you come back to the classroom and the benefits of that and how um, engaged students are when they have those opportunities. There are a couple of other people want to share. Uh, well, in our room, we actually, and then Tracy, you go right after me. I was in our room, we talked about teacher wellness um, mm -hmm. and de stressing um, from physical ailments getting better to just that refreshing of the air. Yeah, that's great. We're going to talk about a little bit about that later. Yeah. Tracy, over to you. Um, I was just going to say that we were talking about how it allows students to explore the land that is actually around them. They might not normally appreciate or explore. Um, and so then it trickles into maybe that's something that they do with their family uh, later on and just appreciating the actual land around their homes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I didn't get to see it in my group, but you actually see different personalities in your kids when they're outside too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I have a, a boy who speaks, he's, you know, Turkish and he doesn't have anybody that he can translate with in the class. Yeah. And in his, in his ELL class, he started to come out of his shell and talking a little bit, but in our classroom, he's still very quiet. And yet when we're outside, when we're doing activities, he comes out of a shell and, you know, he's talking to kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's a one of the schools that I visited last year. There's a part of the partnership. There's a little girl who um, the early reading coach would work with her frequently. And um, as we passed the community garden, she just came alive and shared about all the things that she um, does with her with her father in the community garden. And the early reading coach said that is the most I've ever heard her speak um, about a topic and just the detail. And so she literally came alive with you know, just all the things that she did with us with her dad in that community garden. So absolutely true. So reflecting back on those goals um, that Sylvia mentioned earlier, um, definitely when we, you know, looked at our findings at the, at the conclusion of the program's first year, it was really evident from the survey comments that many of the teachers, um, educators involved, much like our group here today, were already convinced of the importance and value of outdoor learning. And, and many were also already engaged in outdoor learning to a certain extent. But when we surveyed at the end of the year, we did find that time spent learning outdoors as a result of this initiative was an increase from prior um, to involvement in the initiative. And as this first quote here up top there um, talks about, for some, it was just feeling like there was a permission now to go outside, like this is a good thing, this is supported by my school, it's something we should be doing. And so definitely we saw a rise in the amount of outdoor learning that was happening. In terms of building knowledge and skills, 
Um, earlier, um, we asked uh, educators about what they wanted to learn about, and then that helped the teachers to plan. And when we checked in at the end of the year, most of the educators involved said they had learned a lot, a moderate to a lot about a range of different areas, whether that was supporting student needs, um, the materials that might be needed for outdoor learning, uh, how to teach different areas of the curriculum, uh, how to document the learning outside. And as this, this quote here demonstrates, this teacher talking about, you know, I never would have thought of that idea for math if I hadn't been involved in, in this initiative. And then in terms of becoming more confident outside, a lot of it seemed to be about comfort level. And it was interesting that in the, the planning survey at the beginning in the, of the year, there was very little commentary. We, we asked educators, what do you hope to gain from being involved in this initiative? And very few mentioned their own confidence or comfort level. But that's exactly what happened. We found when we asked a few months later in the check-in, most reported feeling much more comfortable with outdoor learning um, as a result of their participation in the initiative. Um, and, and a lot of that too was perhaps about barriers. Um, so at the beginning of the year, we asked a lot about barriers, like what barriers and what's preventing you from going outside? Um, and a few months later, when we checked in on that, uh, there were very few teachers that were reporting that those areas continued to be barriers for them. And that was suggesting that they were able to address them. Um, and, and that led to them being able to uh, do more outdoor learning. And just in regards to that quote that um, Jan was sharing previously, every time I do PD, I always share that and go back to that because so many times, like, you know, we think about the challenges and the barriers to being outside, whether it's weather or it's um, uh, walking through forms. And there's so many things. And so just the ways that um, uh, host teachers and schools have been able to work together to navigate that and, and come together to find solutions has been really remarkable. And, um, and it's really um, shown just the ability to problem solve to make that make this happen and the importance of it happening and students engaging in outdoors. And so many of you talked about this in your, in your groups about the benefits to outdoor learning and um, so increased engagement and student learning. We've shared examples about that, how learning comes alive, how students are engaged and um, it's an opportunity for them to have hands-on opportunities, um, experimental learning, uh, problem solving, um, personal social development. Um, so many times we hear about children with exceptionalities, how well they do outside and how some of those concerns around self-regulation that sometimes um, presents itself in the classroom, uh, sometimes it doesn't present itself outdoors and ways that students are able to, to navigate that. Um, and we know about the benefits of increased mental health, not just for students, but also for educators. I was talking to an educator a few months ago and she said that she kind of just with the busyness of school life, she kind of moved away from going outside as often. And on that particular day, she was very intentional about taking her students outside. And she just was reminded of how outside grounds her. And so with all the things to do and all the things that you're being bombarded with, how that moment to be outside as an educator was making her a better educator because it helps to ground her. And um, just that deeper connection with the natural world, whether it's just being still in a sit spot or listening to the water or the birds, just that moment to be still and, and just to take that all in um, has been very beneficial. So this morning I had a coordinators meeting, we had it at one of our centers at Forest Valley and the coordinators were just like, oh my goodness, like what a beautiful space to be in, to just start your day, like what a perfect way to start your day with a nature walk and, and just being in the outdoors. Um, so this part was just the different ways that um, we noticed that students um, showed their engagement and focus and how their attention was increased and oftentimes students compared this to the to being in the classroom and so um, and how they're flown outdoors and how they are able to keep their attention and um, and how they inside they lose focus a lot but in, outside it was it was different. And I think if I if I would add to this one, it was interesting mm -hmm. because in the in the survey comments, teachers noted that they were really looking for ways, you know, why they became involved in this initiative. They were really looking mm -hmm. for ways to make learning more fun, exciting, and engaging. And it seems like that's exactly what happened because when students described how outdoor learning helped them to learn, um, many of them talked about that. It was easier when the learning was more interactive and hands-on was something that came up in our group as well. Um, and also, as we talked about, it seems like students come to life more outdoors, their energy levels pop. Uh, and teachers commented on similar to some of the discussion in the groups, students that that wasn't happening for in the classroom, all of a sudden seeing it happening outside. And you could mm -hmm. see that just for some students, this was really just a better fit for their learning. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so many times um, we saw, just go back for a second, please, uh, Pam. So many times we saw with personal and interpersonal skills, as we continue to crawl out of COVID, uh, we talk a lot about student social skills and how they interact with each other and how there's such a difference pre-COVID and as we start to creep out of this, of how students interact and, and relate to each other. And time and time again, uh, we saw the benefits of when students were engaged in outdoor activities, whether it was team building, whether it was doing an activity together with their peers, how their personal and social skills improved, how they found ways to include some of the students who maybe were on the outside and not really a part of the activity, how they found ways to engage in team building, um, how they thought differently about each other and how nature was an example of the system that works together and um, that they were able to mimic some of that and, and understand that in a deeper way. Um, so we saw so many gains as it relates to their personal and interpersonal skills. And, and as, as we shared it, the, the impact on their mental health and their well and their well-being and how um, just being able to sit in nature and just be in that space, how it was common, it helps them to self-regulate. Um, it helps them to appreciate. Someone mentioned about observing. There's so many things that, you know, sometimes we just pass and we don't really observe and really notice. And for students to build those observation skills, but this is maybe the same tree you pass every day, but there's something different about it. Um, in one of the schools, um, each of the, the, teach, the students have adopted a tree and they observe the tree and all of that. And on this particular day, um, Lambton uh, uh, School, which is pretty much Jane and Finch Corridor, the student looked up um, at a tree and there was an owl up in her tree um, mm. that she was observing. And just, she was just so thrilled. First of all, to see an owl in the city, but it just sat there as the kids were screaming and excited. And, um, but that was through observation because it's a tree that they would have passed many times, um, you know, throughout the day. And, and there the owl was um, up in that tree. On this uh, topic of mental health and well-being, this was also an area where the teachers' comments early on when we asked in the very first survey, like why they wanted to do the initiative, this was a big theme. A lot of teachers volunteered because they really wanted, they shared their beliefs that students need to be connected to nature and in contact with nature, sunlight and fresh air for their mental health. And then the students really noticed that as the quote here shows. Um, and in their, their comments, they described how good it felt to be outside. Um, to get up and be able to stretch, to have space, move around, walk on the grass, breathe fresh air. Um, and in a lot of their quotes, they used words like, you know, feeling calm and peaceful and happy when they were outside. And the outdoor educators noticed this as well, and, and, the, and the host teachers, um, particularly in some of the students' written reflections and videos, that the kids went into a lot of detail about how outdoor learning made them feel. Um, like this student here talking about, you know, closing their eyes and just feeling so calm and never really realizing that nature could be so calming. And um, yeah, as, as we share, just the ability to be in a, in a different learning space, to be connected to, to nature, um, and just the freedom, the freedom of engaging in, in learning through the outdoors, the freedom that that provides for students to use all of their senses, to use, sometimes we brought very simple to easy to find tools and, and use them that to engage in the outdoors, but definitely the freedom to be outdoors and to engage and connect the curriculum. And even sometimes it wasn't connecting the curriculum as we shared, it was connecting it to wellness and to mental health and um, to those social and emotional pieces. But um, just all of those levels of, of that and the benefits of being outdoors for that. And um, as we shared, um, this, this came up time and time again, that along with the benefits for students um, participating in the outdoors, we know that educators experience those benefits as well. And this was a quote from one of the educators. So just a time to reflect a little bit about what you think this might look like, look like in your school uh, community. So if you just take maybe a minute or two to just to type that in the chat, or if you want to popcorn your ideas about what this might look like, maybe it already looks like something like this in your school community. Um, so just a couple of minutes to share what it has or what it could look like. Sylvia and Jen, um, while the others are thinking, I think there's a couple of things that I'm going to be taking away one is that if you already love the outdoors yourself, find somebody that you can be a partner with um, in your school, because sometimes doing uh, helping someone else get through the barriers uh, and co-planning, there's so much richness uh, working with in teams and we love having each other. So, for example, I remember when I taught grade six, my co-worker wasn't so happy about the outdoors, but I took her classes outside uh, to grab grab some things about uh, microscopy that was a unit back then 
And, um, and so uh, by working with her, I helped her get comfort with the outdoors. And then she helped me with some of the other things that I was new with. So finding that partner. And I also think of our TCs, Hillary, uh, and their work with uh, uh, that. And maybe you could speak to a little bit about that while people are putting in the chat. Absolutely. So I um, I started this last uh, spring. And in fact, one of my TCs was in the room, Catherine. She can speak to her experience in the course. I think she enjoyed it. Um, uh, but teaching graduate courses for teacher candidates and others, uh, training in education, fully outside. So modeling what it can look like to do both place-based um, and environmental learning um, using city as classroom. And certainly the responses I got back from my adult students last spring uh, was incredibly positive. They seem to really enjoy it. And um, I figure that's what we need to be doing in teacher education is we need to model for them what this can look like uh, and uh, take those risks right in their early pre-service uh, days. Um, because that's the problem is many teachers never had that modeled for them in their own teacher education. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Ian's in the room and put a heart up as well. And, and I think of you, like Melissa, you are so experienced. Can you imagine taking on a, a teacher candidate and bringing them along um, and helping spread that good news? And so um, all of the things that we've heard uh, Jan and I were talking about um, was captured here in a collaborative approach to outdoor learning support in schools. Um, I'm just gonna grab that link. And so you can read more about um, that findings and um and the research and all of those pieces uh from this report and i'll put that in the chat jen did you want to add anything else there um no i would just say that now what we're doing is really trying you know in this um, webinar today is one example of it we're really just trying to mobilize this knowledge now and share it um, in many different formats and spaces uh with a goal of increasing outdoor learning across the system and Sylvia, maybe you want to talk about a few of those things there. The conference is there, the BAMP conference, but there's lots yeah. of other lots of other knowledge mobilization that you've been doing um, and that we've been doing together. For sure. So, uh, so we've been sharing the knowledge, of course, within our team and like constantly getting more documentation from them about what they're seeing in the field, as well as I have a school that I support as well, in addition to the whole initiative. So building our own capacity with what we're seeing in different spaces. Um, we had a host teacher, all host teachers who are part of the initiative. We had a, a huge capacity building meeting with everyone PD that was on in March. Um, we meet regularly with the principals who are uh, who are uh, administrators for the schools uh, to connect with them about how outdoor learning is going, what we are finding, connecting them with other schools that are also part of the partnership to build that capacity, um, connected with um, our outdoor education department. So sharing what we're finding in schools so that we're making um, changes as necessary with our outdoor ed centers to make sure our programs are reflective of what's happening in schools and we're being responsive. Um, uh, Eco Schools Department working with Pam closely um, and her work with Eco Schools. I've done uh, lunch and learns at different schools um, as it relates to elder learning and the importance and helping teachers um, who are not necessarily a part of the um, elder learning support to schools, but just want more ideas or just want someone to work with. I've worked with teachers in that area. Uh, we've John and I have created infographics to capture just the benefits and the research findings and student feedback and teacher feedback um, through infographics and that's been it's being shared it's it's coming through uh, the board and that system sharing is happening. Um, the, we're having a beginning teachers May 4th and May 11th uh, to share some of the findings, but also to get teachers in their early stages of their career to get outside more and, and the, the benefits of that. Uh, so that's coming up for beginning teachers, a conference for May 4th and May 11th uh, for teachers uh, K to, to, to secondary and um, continuing webinars like this with OISE um, to share about uh, the support to school and the partnerships. And then uh, next week, <laughs> we leave for BAM for John and I, and we're going to be sharing our findings um, uh, as a really solid builder and support to schools, what it took to get this started and, and what that work is looking like. And then finally, um, here are some places where you can find resources, um, uh, Take Learning Outdoors. Uh, that's one of our website links that's also connected to our, our, um, our Toronto Outdoor Education website. Uh, so tons of resources there. Next month is Get Outside Month. Uh, so there's literally a lesson every single day um, and it's connected to STEM and coding this year. And so lots of outdoor activities that are connected to that. 
Okay. And how does our time always fly so fast? I know. <laughs> um, so I've also put I've also put in the chat and we'll be sending you some information. So uh, first thing first, uh, there's a feedback poll. Let the folks know how they uh, met your learning needs. Um, but Sylvia and I, fondly enough, uh, tried to put a, a sort of a, a little meeting together of people who do this and love this work. Uh, so you that are outdoor ed preps, uh, you that love outdoor ed, um, you that just do this because you think it's amazing or you are a prep teacher. Um, I will use this list um, to mm -hmm. let you know the opportunity to uh, connect with us so that we can learn from you and you can get support because you're probably, you know, um, <laughs> you're out there doing amazing work and we just want to make sure that you're acknowledged and that we can build your skills, but also share the good work that you're doing uh, and share the best practices because you are already uh, fabulous. So uh, we'll continue to do that. But now we know who to send it to, Sylvia. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Drop, drop one. <laughs> we had one targeted. person. We had one. <laughs> it's like we know there's more than one person doing this work and it'd be so great to even connect some of the teachers here with some of the teachers who are part of the partnership because already I see connections and ways that, um, yeah, that things are just uh, all connected to each other. Yeah, so Denise, hopefully that will answer your question. Uh, Sylvia probably will be able to answer your question specifically about the collaboration because we don't pick the schools, it's the superintendent. But I do have one minute left. We have an amazing event to connect in person. Uh, Hillary, do you want to just put that slide up, um, uh, BCI? We're at Burnham Thorpe uh, Farms uh, to see that amazing stuff. And Hillary doesn't know this yet, but I hopefully have a webinar that's coming up May 17th on for secondary teachers on trees, ArcGIS, and uh, looking at carbon capture uh, with that. And that's um, just fresh off the press, <laughs> hopefully uh, May 17th, I should say. And yep, so I haven't even put it on the slide. So, but June 6th, save the date. We hope to be in person around amazing fresh food with food share at uh, the Burnham Thorpe Collegiate and get to see you in person. Give those hugs that I've been doing virtually for so long. Um, so we'd love to have you there. And Hillary, is there anything else I've forgotten? You did not. You covered it all, Pam. Thank you so much for hosting today. That was you did a fantastic job. <laughs> Great. Well, happy to do that. A big thanks to Sylvia and Jan for bringing their, their work here. Again, it's uh, insights that you can tell principals that this work is being done on TDSB and also will su that supports your work. And sometimes that's the most important part, that this work is being supported and um, we've got data to prove it. Uh, so it is 501. Oh my gosh. If you haven't done your feedback poll, go ahead and do that. And uh, thank you so much. If you have any questions that weren't answered, we'll be on for the next four or five minutes. Uh, you can put that in the chat or unmute yourself. Okay. Happy, what is today? Uh, Monday. 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 <laughs> happy Monday. Monday. Good Monday. Good Monday.